Okay, very good. So we're going to talk about, or I'm going to give a talk about uh, evolutionary metaphysics today. And I know I shared um, an article from Dan Dennett. Um, that will be the kind of heart of the, the center of this talk. Um, but before I get to that, I have a little just prologue to give about the, the topic in general. And then I'll dive more into uh, you know, some applications from, from Dan Dennett's uh, paper based on some of the work that I've been doing. So when the evolutionary, uh, sorry, when the Vienna Circle first started meeting, um, David Edmonds said in his book that they spent months going through line by line, um, this book by Ludwig Wittgenstein, the, known as the, the Tractatus. And um, David Leake shared a really interesting New Yorker piece about Wittgenstein um, over the last week on, on Hilo that really hit home how, um, Kind of mysterious and up and down this book was Wittgenstein himself uh, disowned it by the end of his life and wrote another book that was published after his death that kind of refuted most of the ideas in it but um, the most famous line uh, is the very last one in the book um, it's what we cannot speak about we must pass over in silence and this probably best represents the attempt that the Vienna Circle was was uh, making on metaphysics and knowledge and epistemology in general. And what they meant, you know, by this sort of maybe obvious or cryptic sentence is that, you know, they were, they were aiming to create a, a perfect language and a, and, a, and a perfect knowledge that was based in, uh, in reality just as much as, as the physics of their time was, or so they thought. And you know, if, if you couldn't speak about something that perfectly, well then don't talk about it at all. You must pass over in silence. But of course, you know, well, they ended up failing in that, uh, in that pursuit and philosophers talk about all kinds of things that, that don't, uh, don't meet that criteria of, of perfect knowledge. I see just several of them here. And so this led me to, um, you know, one of my favorite anecdotes from David Emmons' book, which was that uh, this member of the group, Otto Neurath, was, uh, you know, really stuck on keeping this, keeping to this, uh, this rigorous idea of never discussing things we, 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 we could, uh, we couldn't see, touch, or, or taste, whatever, what have you. And anytime the group kind of wandered into that, he would just bang on the table and shout, metaphysics, metaphysics. And he would apparently do this, you know, so often they, they sometimes joke, you know, you're better off shouting when we're, when we're, we're not talking about metaphysics. Now, he was kind of a, a big, loud, apparently obnoxious guy that they said, Dave Edmonds said that several of the members wouldn't invite him to their house or out for dinner. So um, I'm not planning to do any, any banging on tables like that. But I, I did think about, you know, maybe making a sign or something and, and just kind of hold it up or I don't, I don't think that's going to happen too much in our meetings or, or other meetings, but something to think about. But of course, you, you, you can't just shout down, you know, philosophical arguments and metaphysics, you have to, you have to argue against them. And there have been loads of attacks on, you know, this sort of physicalist metaphysics um, over the, over the centuries. And a couple of years ago, I worked through this book um, from Julian Bagini, which listed 100 philosophical thought experiments. It's called The Pig That Wants to Be Eaten. And uh, 19 out of the 100 were about metaphysics and kind of uh, again, you know, presenting different attacks and trying to, trying to prove the existence of gods, souls, minds, zombies, what have you, anything kind of immaterial that would show that the universe isn't just you know, what it appears to be to us. But um, going through those from an evolutionary perspective, I found, and I'm not alone in this, but, that none of them, none of them were persuasive. So that led me to my current position um, that, that I show on my website of that the hypothesis of a physical universe survives. As I say down here, there's kind of the one sentence summary. And the, the language around hypothesis and survives is something to do with, uh, with, with epistemology, which we can get into at some other point. But like I said, I, I'm not alone in this. Um, the, the Stoic philosopher and evolutionary biologist Massimo Pigliucci had a really interesting post about this recently, trying to sum up his own thoughts about metaphysics. Uh, and he had this post called Metaphysics Dissolved because who needs it? Um, he 
wrote that uh, this piece mostly kind of recapturing um, and affirming what he had read in, in this book from James Ladyman and Don Ross called Everything Must Go, Metaphysics Naturalized. I haven't read that book yet. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get to it. But um, basically what they're claiming, according to Massimo, is that the job of philosophers should be to uh, synthesize all of the natural knowledge we have out there rather than spend time you know, speculating about what is out there. And Massimo is not one to pull punches. Uh, he had this phrase that I quoted below about David Chalmers that all his speculations are, are quote, you know, not even wrong. That that they don't exist in a in a in a plane where you can where you could ever test them, so um, yeah. So that that's uh, you know another sort of argument for this naturalized metaphysics. When I talked about this a couple of years ago um, to a local group, I presented it this way that you could just drop the meta from metaphysics. And I thought that was maybe a, a simple way to get past some of the jargon for for the lay people that I was. You know, speaking to, um, but uh, of course, you know, physicalism or naturalism, as it's also known, is uh, is it's, it's it's a metaphysical position. So it's it's not that metaphysics is gone. I don't want to to try to to to, to say that. And of course, I don't mean that physics is all that uh, that matters either. We're we're influenced by by much more than physics. Uh, we have chemistry and biology, and germane to this group is evolution, of course. So that brings me to the paper that from Dan Dennett that I shared, which was drawn from this book, How Biology Shapes Philosophy, New Foundations for Naturalism. It was published in 2017. Um, Dan's paper uh, was the first, first one in this edited collection from a variety of philosophers. Um, and I thought it was you know, just perfect for, for setting up evolutionary philosophy. Uh, so I didn't ask like how many people have read this, but so it doesn't matter if you haven't. I'm gonna just share, um, nine quotes from it that um, kind of help summarize it and maybe drive home some of the some of the key some of the key parts of it. So first, right at the very beginning, Dan makes the point that you know ever since Socrates, the idea of clear, sharp boundaries has been one of the founding principles of philosophy. But that you know Darwin showed us that the, the sets of living things were not eternal, hard-edged in or out classes. So still, then it notice, notes that uh, you know, philosophers tried to impose their cl classical logic on the world as if Darwin never existed. Dan would say that this is a, a methodological, not a metaphysical prejudice. He's not claiming that philosophers you know, don't believe in evolution. It's just that they tend to think we can go back to business as usual, tolerating Darwinian population thinking among those with the taste for such practices, but denying its application for our chosen topic. But Dan pushes back on that and says, you know, these undeniable borderline cases that exist in nature are not just a nuisance. They, they typically disable the arguments altogether. And he kind of ropes in the, the, uh, the biologist Richard Dawkins to, to, to back him up on this and where notes that Dawkins says there are good reasons for having tidy, discrete names in things like taxonomy and biology, but we mustn't mistake our convenient agreements for discoveries. There aren't, there just aren't, uh, you know, real objective joints in nature, uh, as a paraphrase of, of what, what Plato said all those years ago. And that led to me to what was, uh, you know, in, in the middle of the passage, a, a real clarion call for what evolutionary philosophy is, and that this, key sentence to me it said in particular the demand for essences with sharp boundaries blinds thinkers to the prospect of gradualist theories of complex phenomena such as life intentions natural selection itself more responsibility and consciousness so there's a, a hopes of things we can look at as again these gradualist theories of complex phenomena is what we're looking for and we'll have more to say about some of these topics later So not just uh, the fact that these are gradualist theories, but then it also gives us a place where we can think about how to start looking at these things that they, you know, bubble up in the, in the bubble up theory of creation. You have to you know, start at the bottom. 
And he has this kind of fantastic quote from a critic of Darwin in the 1800s who said, you know, Mr. Darwin, who by a strange inversion of reasoning seems to think absolute ignorance fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom. And as Dana makes clear, this is absolutely a, you know, a perfect description of what is going on with, with evolution in nature, that it does start with absolute ignorance. And we should be, you know, thinking about philosophy and doing that in, in the same way, starting there rather than starting with these, you know, highfalutin, a priori, perfect concepts at the top. So in addition to those, Dan also gives a, you know, kind of an operator on how to think about this, this sorta comment. He says, you know, why indulge in this sorta talk? And he says the sorta operator is in cognitive science, the parallel of Darwin's gradualism and evolutionary processes. And, you know, what he's getting at here is that any anytime we say, you know, something is or was or will be, you're kind of locking yourself into, uh, it's, it's much easier to, to fall prone to thinking about things in terms of definitions and which are naturally, you know, hard edged in or out things. Whereas if you say, you know, something's sort of intelligent or sort of conscious or that sort of knowledge, uh, you already start to, to, to put in a little bit of fuzziness around the edges to, to help keep that in mind when you're, when you're starting to make arguments about these things. Obviously, we're not going to you know, talk about sorta all the time, but it, it's, it's useful to, to use occasionally as necessary. And finally, the very last page passage in, in, the, the, in, the, in the paper um, was another real clarion call to me for, for evolutionary philosophy and what we're doing here. So he said, you know, in the last paragraph, there are no other philosophical, I'm sorry, there are other philosophical puzzles that can benefit, I suspect, from exploring the no longer forbidden territory opened up by Darwin's critique of essentialism. We can perhaps begin to reconstruct the most elevated philosophical concepts, concepts from more modest ingredients. And I think this is really key for us. And really, you know, when I first read this, I was like, yes, this is, <laughs> I've been at this for a while. And, and I felt that, you know, this was, really backing up what, what I had been working on to that we could explore this no longer forbidden territory and reconstruct the most elevated philosophical concepts. So with that, I'm gonna to turn to how to how I have worked on applying some of these ideas in the past to kind of drive it home and uh, make this a little more um, real, tangible. I thought I'd start with something as simple as the, the meaning of life. Um, there's a BBC radio program called The Moral Maze, um, where they usually have a panel of people discussing moral issues of the times. And generally it's infuriating and I'm constantly shouting at the radio when I hear them discuss these things. But uh, back at Christmas time, um, just this, this last year, they um, had a special panel uh, to discuss the meaning of life. And they had um, amongst the, the, the panel members was uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's like the Pope for the Church of England, if you don't know. And they had the president of Humanist UK, Alice Roberts at the time, kind of discussed this along with, I think, uh, a writer who was a nihilist and, and I believe an a Muslim scholar as well. And as they went through this, they had the typical kind of dogmatic or nihilistic or uh, relativistic presentations of what they thought the meaning of life was. Alice, uh, in particular from Humanist UK, was kind of presented that typical, everyone has their own meaning for life and we're, we're not against any of them. Um, and that, that's, that was fine, but it kind of spurred me to write something for our local humanist group um, in, our, in our monthly newsletter that, you know, first I started with this idea from Dan Dennett's paper of Darwin's strange inversion of logic, I'm sorry, of, of reasoning, and I said, you know, in exactly the same way, there is no singular top-down meaning of life that comes booming down to us from on high. And as much as we joke about 42 is the answer, that, that's, that's just not there. Instead, meanings are built up through trials and errors, but only some of these meanings, however, lead towards more survival and flourishing for life on this planet. So that's, you know, one simple way of looking at a concept in a gradualist manner and coming to kind of a different answer for, for how you might, might approach this rather than uh, what's typically presented. And that last paragraph kind of leads, or last sentence 
is a reference to the evolutionary ethics that I that I've worked on, and that's the, the next topic I'll talk on. So there's uh, my very first academic paper was was about this topic where I tried to use an evolutionary lens to bridge David Hume's is ought divide, and there's um, you know we can talk about that when we talk about ethics some other time. So I won't go into any details on that, but the uh, conclusion of the paper was that life ought to act to rem remain alive, that our morals ought to be, you know, driving us towards survival. If not, well, then, you know, the, our, the group that's acting on those, on those morals won't, won't survive, and then neither will the morals as well. And that's just, a, you know, kind of a card hold, cold hard fact of, of evolution. Um, I got a lot of pushback on this article, as you would expect. Um, and but one of the um, common threads that is relevant for today was a lot of people looked at this this bottom one and said, you know, morals they can't just be about remaining alive. That's that's too simple. Uh, it's about much more than that. It's about well-being and eudaimonia and highfalutin things. And to me, this was you know kind of a classic example of essentialist concepts of surviving so a lot of you know this this cartoon sort of captures that perfectly where if you think of surviving just as the most basic thing of eat survive reproduce and all the the, the lower uh, non-human animals only ever think of that until suddenly humans stand up and say oh what's it all about it must be it must be something else much more above that um, that's you know an essentialist concept of what surviving is about. You're thinking it's not changing at all throughout throughout the entire history of evolution, and that of course isn't isn't true. Um, you know, non-human animals have a, a, a also an emerging gradualist view of of all of their needs and and what what gives them well-being in their in their own concept. I mean, that, not that they have words for this or think about it that way, but but it's 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 much more than the most basic things, and that of course takes off with, uh, with humans and culture and, and what we've developed over the last million years or so. But the, um, yeah, but it, this is an essentialist concept. And what I really wanted to deal with was some kind of gradualist concept of surviving as well to sort of display all of that, that growing uh, list of, of needs that, uh, that, that we have. And so I wrote this paper called, um, Replacing Maslow with an Evolutionary Hierarchy of Needs. It was originally published on patheos.com with the help of, of two professors of um, evolutionary psychology. But Patheos has since taken down all, uh, all work on their atheist channel. So I've had to recreate it on my own website if you, if you want to read more details about that. So starting with you know with the sort of a classic gradual presentation of, of well-being is, is Maslow's hierarchy that starts at the bottom of physiological needs and then goes up to you know through the different levels, love and belonging, self-esteem, and self-actualization at the top. And as I said before, the um, you know the, these levels at the top uh, don't sorry. Uh, if, if they're not also driving towards um, towards survival, then they're they're probably not you know the right needs to be fulfilling. So they, they you know they will be deselected eventually. Now, of course, Maslow never actually presented this as a pyramid. And if you read his work, or if you've ever you know, we all have had these moments of self actualization and where you, you're feeling alive with meaning and purpose. This is what it actually feels like. Where the you know the phys the top kind of takes over and the physiological needs at the bottom sort of sort of fall away, but upside down pyramids don't look very stable. So I worked on you know kind of a new better image, and I settled on the the typical tree that evolutionary thinkers like to use, where the the, the bottom is a strong trunk that's bringing up nutrients from the bottom. The next level of safety and security kind of provides. Uh, you know, a canopy under which people could, could be in. The love and belonging and self-esteem are the tangled branches in between so at the middle of the tree. And then the, the self-actualization at the top that, you know, 
pulls us towards something bigger than ourselves is similar to the way that the top of a tree is, is being pulled towards towards sunlight and gaining you know energy and, and strength from from the things that are above it so that is you know a nice way of looking at the gradualist view of survival but it's only one slice um, of you know what we want to concern ourselves with it's only considering with ourselves with individuals um, and human individuals at that. In E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience, he noted, you know, what, what we, I should back up and say what we, what we really want is, you know, not just to concern ourselves with, with human individuals, but, you know, with, with all of life. And in E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience, he gave us these seven concentric circles that uh, he was, he put together to try to unite all of the fields of biology around the concept of, uh, of space and time, you know, growing outwards as, as you go through these different fields. And what he ended up doing was, you know, presenting a picture of all of biology, which is also essentially a picture of all of life, all, that, all of life that has ever been or will ever be. And so if we want to concern ourselves with that, you know, that well-being of life, we should, try to work on some kind of you know Maslow's hierarchy of needs for all of the circles. So that's what I worked on um, for the rest of the article. Um, just run a quick sketch through. The first thing I had to do is kind of generalize Maslow's levels to, to make them you know less about human things and, and more generalizable that, that any of those structures can use. And to make a long story short, I came up with um, a set of a set of Maslow's hierarchy, a set of hierarchy of needs for all of the different levels of biology. And, you know, you, you start to get a picture of what fragile survival would look like where you're really only focusing on the basic needs of individuals. And, you know, that's kind of where the case we're in now with many governments, for example, just looking at GDP and a couple of health indicators and not much else. Whereas you can imagine, you know, a world where there's robust survival, where we're trying to fill in uh, and meet the, the needs of all of life as, as much as possible. And you know, we're starting to see inklings of this with things like the UN sustainability goals, um, Kate Rower's donut economics or the planetary boundaries, but th those are all kind of pieces and parts of what, what I consider to be this, this map of, of how we would look at all of life. So back to the, you know, the, the question at hand of, of my evolutionary ethics that end with life ought to act to remain alive. It, you know, if you take that essentialist view of thinking of survival and acting to remain alive as, as, as simplistic as, as I laid out, this is a problem. But, but hopefully, you know, once you have this kind of greater concept of, of how survival and meaning and well-being can, can grow and, and, and can continue to expand across all of life, um, it's a much bigger picture, I think. So once, um, once I had something done for evolutionary ethics, I ended up turning my next uh, paper to evolutionary politics. Uh, I wrote this with my wife, Tanya Wyatt, who is a criminologist. And as a criminologist, she spends a lot of time reading and writing and thinking about justice system. And the justice system is based in, large, in liberal democracies, largely on the work of utilitarians and John Stuart Mill's harm principle, which was published uh, ironically in 1859, the same year Darwin published uh, on the origin of species. But, you know, he, that's, this idea of a harm principle sounds great. It says, you know, we can do whatever you want in society uh, as long as you don't harm others. But without a good definition of harm, you're, you're not really kind of kind of helping much. And this is what sort of happened over the next several hundred years of, of building democracies around this idea. Until in the in the late 90s, there's a legal scholar named Bernard Harcourt who published a seminal paper called uh, The Collapse of the Harm Principle. That without you know, a good definition of harm, you have no way of trading off or you know understanding um, you know which harm is more important than another one and you end up just kind of going back to to might makes right to whoever's in power at the time gets to decide which harms matter more than others uh, and so 
you know, my, my wife and I wrote this paper where we tried to address this. Um, and the paper is called Rebuilding the Harm Principle Using an Evolutionary Perspective to Provide a New Foundation for Justice. And we, we took that definition of good that I had written uh, in a previous paper, where it's, you know, good was uh, about making life more, or so, sorry, the survival of life more robust. And so harm is just going to be the opposite of that, which harm is that which makes the survival of life more fragile. Again, this is a, a topic for another day to get into all the details, but uh, you know, this is the, again, another kind of gradualist view of, uh, in this case, harm that, that helps us understand the problems that, uh, that are involved in politics much better than some kind of essentialist definition of a harm could, could ever hope to, to, to provide. So, so far I've, um, we've been talking about gradualism kind of in one dimension for these theoretical ideas of uh, good, harm, uh, survival and the meaning of life. But um, there's another tool in the evolutionary toolkit um, that I find really uh, useful for this that helps make this gradualism multidimensional. And that's uh, Tim Bergen's four questions. This, Tim Bergen is, was an ethologist who put these together to, to help um, really understand anything, this is what his claim is, to understand anything in biology, you really have to understand these four different parts of, of the organism. And this is a you know, classic two by two matrix where one axis is about the difference between ultimate and proximate causes. And the other axis is you know, looking at things in a, in a current time frame versus a historic time frame. And so we end up with these questions around um, mechanisms, you know, what, what is what are the underlying uh, bits and bobs that are that are chugging away inside of the organism to to cause these things? What is the the evolutionary function um, that will cause things to happen? Or you can look at you know the the personal development of of, a, of an organism. That's the ontogeny, so its own you know just singular life uh, life history. Or you can look at the phy phylogeny, the, you know, the, the evolutionary history that led up to that, that individual organism. And that you know, really to understand uh, anything in, in the biological world, you need to look at all four of these, these pieces. If, you know, for any of you have read, as we all have read uh, and listened to David Stone Wilson enough, this comes up pretty quickly when, when you hear him for a while, but there are very few philosophers that I've heard ever talk about this. So I decided to, um, to try to use this to look at consciousness and free will. Um, I did this during lockdown uh, over the last, last year and a half. Um, as I you know, kind of was looking for something to do since I couldn't travel internationally anymore, I thought oh, that, that this won't take me too long. I ended up writing, uh, it ended up being a huge project uh, it was, you know, very fruitful and they didn't find anybody else kind of doing something like this. And there was a lot of research to be done. And I ended up putting together about 260 pages worth of stuff that I have in this little PDF booklet that I've collected. And, you know, it, it's still kind of in its early stages were just me and the, the handful of, of good uh, review, readers on my blog have reviewed, but I'd, I'd like to still uh, push this out, try to push out pieces of it in the in, in, uh, in academic peer-reviewed stuff to see if it, if it continues to hold up. But it's a good example of using Tin Bergen um, for evolutionary uh, questions or, and philosophy questions. So I, that's you know, what I wanted to, to share that. One of the chapters that, uh, that I wrote was, was looking at, the, the, I wanted to look at the history of, the, of these definitions of consciousness. And you'll note the, the Dennett operator in there, the, the sorta. It's, it's obviously a nod to Dennett, but it's also because it was not that brief of a history. Ended up being 5,600 words, which is about 10 pages uh, of just definitions. It had 28 different entries from philosophers, 25 entries from the science scientists, and six entries from, from different dictionary definitions, almost all you know, incompatible and, and disagreeing with one another. As the Wikipedia entry on consciousness notes, this, this level of disagreement about the meaning of the word indicates that it either means different things to different people or else it encompasses a variety of distinct meanings with no simple element in common. Now, for you know, looking at what we've been talking about today, it's clear that 
most of these definitions of consciousness have been looking for an essentialist in or out box that just isn't going to be there. That consciousness is clearly another one of these complex phenomena of, in the biological world that's much better handled with sort of a, you know, a gradualist perspective on it. And especially, you know, one that Tinbergen can give us. So to make a very long story short, uh, I, I did that. I worked on a Tim Berg, I came up with a different hierarchies of consciousness as it emerges from the origins of life to you know, the, the, the highest levels of, that, that, we, that might be attainable in nature. Um, came up with these hierarchies for each of the four quadrants of Tim Berg. And, and that's one of the beauties of Tim Berg is that it ends up providing you know, independent lines of research that you can check against one another. So if you, know, if you have this theory of how consciousness emerges according to the mechanisms or the functions, but that doesn't map at all with how it, how it emerges in the, the, the life of a single human or the evolutionary history of life at all, then you, you have to tinker and play around with that. And that's what I was able to do until they, they kind of all started to mesh and where I, I think um, I came up with you know, sort of emergence of these, all of the different properties that, that are generally considered within consciousness. Um, you can see how they, uh, how they emerge together and prevent sort of this gradualist approach. Uh, same thing applies for, for free will. The, the, the two concepts are very tightly related. As uh, Dan Bennett and others have said, you really can't deal with one without dealing with the other. And so I, I put together a, also a, a, a chart of this. And I don't have much time left. So let me um, just say very quickly that while I was doing this, I got the opportunity to um, do a book review of Dan Dennett's book with Greg Caruso on free will called Debating Free Will. Uh, sorry, called Just Desserts. So it's, desserts is a, is a term meaning, you know, do we deserve to be blamed or punished? This isn't about uh, strawberry shortcake uh, or, or other types of, of, des of lovely dessert. Um, and Dan and Greg kind of went back and forth a lot. Um, Greg is a one of these classic essentialists. He draws beautiful boxes around all of his definitions. Um, and he comes to the conclusion that there is no free will, there is no more responsibility. We have to get rid of all prisons and we have to use a public quarantine health model. And Dan says, whoa, 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 that's that's way too much to throw out for you know this kind of essentialist thinking. That's not the way we should be thinking about free will. You know, he comes up with this gradualist approach that uh, is um, that he defines as achieving the free will worth wanting. So we don't have a perfect free will, but we have, we have something here, some sort of free will, if you will. And now Dan holds his own very well against Greg in my view, um, but he has never once used the Tinbergen phrase as, as far as I know. So I use my, my review here as, as kind of the opportunity to introduce that, that, that concept into the, the discussion uh, and ended up with that sort of rhetorical question. So is free will more like a geometry proof or a frog? And to me, it's, it's pretty obvious that it's, it's more of a complex biological phenomenon like a frog and should therefore be treated as such like, uh, like we've done with the, with the Tinbergen analyses. One, one last slide. Um, this is a work in progress, so don't look at this too much, but I'm, I'm currently working on a paper on evolutionary epistemology where I'm looking at the, you know, the, the evolution of knowledge. Um, this is you know, another classic philosophical problem of essentialism where Plato tried to define it 2000 years ago as justified true beliefs. And philosophers have been trying for thousands of years to, to find knowledge, uh, to find ideas and beliefs that are able to, to fit that bill and meet all those essential qualities. And they have of course failed along the way to do that. And so we're, we're still stuck um, dealing, uh, discussing this, this problem. And my contention in this paper will be that, you know, again, we need to start with uh, this strange inversion of, of reasoning and start at the bottom where we have absolute ignorance and we'll trace the evolutionary you know, history of knowledge mechanisms as, as we, we, we learn to learn and grow up new, new ways to learn. Uh, until we you know, build more and more robust knowledge, never quite reaching the level of truths and falsehoods. We, we know this from, from certain skeptical arguments that we, we can't ever claim to know truth because we just can't know the future. We can't know what that will, uh, what that will bring and maybe overturn you know, our ideas we have. 
but that's okay. Um, this sort of understanding would give us a much, much clearer way to talk about knowledge and, and how strong it is or how, how fragile it is. And I, I think that can do a lot to overturn all the, the nonsense we see in the, in the news about you know, fake news and, uh, and truthiness and the like. At least that's my hope. So Ed, quick question, may I ask? Yes. Oh. Just on that last picture, uh, yeah. the vertical dimension is time? Um, yes, not, uh, yeah, I would say yes. So again, <laughs> this is my first sketch to, to help me cor corral my thoughts. I haven't, uh, I, I wouldn't say I, I've defined that perfectly yet, but, but yeah, I would say um, time. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that helps. Okay. <laughs> oh, thanks, Andy. I'm glad you're here, by the way. Um, glad to be here. Right. <laughs> that's my last slide, though. Um, I try to present what I think of for evolutionary metaphysics is, is really inspiring to me and for this group in particular about all of the different places that, that we can take this, this evolutionary worldview that we've been given um, and, and really try to, try to make changes to, to the way philosophy works. And I know that was a giant fire hose of, of information. So I'd like to um, try something I use with some local groups and just take maybe three minutes of silence to let you collect your thoughts and let me go get a drink of water. And then I'll come back and uh, unshare my screen and we can have a couple, we can have, have some questions and comments if that's okay. All right, thanks. I'll be right back.